our next speaker. Actually, I first met him years ago at a paella party in Washington, D.C. That was the first time we met each other. And despite his well-known well-knownness, well, consider that a word, despite his, his, his fame, there are actually 60 people in the United States named David Shore. And three of them are exactly 30 years old and work in progressive politics. So despite him being one of a kind, he is one of three and one of 60. Everyone, please welcome David. Real honor to, uh, to be here. Uh, and present to you all. Uh, you know, even though most of most of my shop at this point uses Python, I am uh, the lone. Uh, the, I mean, not the lone. All of the Bayesians are the lone. R holdouts. R holds a very special place in my heart, and you know, I think is the basis of most of the things that we discover. Uh, so this talk is uh, going to be about politics. Hopefully, uh, people still like hearing about politics. Uh, and in particular, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that we did in 2020. And uh, you know, obviously uh, we're still doing the same kind of stuff. So the first is, uh, who are we? Uh, you know, I'm one of the co-founders at Blue Rose Research. Uh, and so the first thing is it was uh, founded by alumni of the Obama 2012 campaign uh, and their analytics team specifically, which at the time was uh, known as The Cave. Uh, in 2020, we worked with basically every uh, 2020 Democratic uh, presidential campaign during the primaries, most of the major party committees and super PACs and most outside groups, which is a fancy way of saying groups like labor unions, Planned Parenthood, et cetera. Um, the kinds of problems that we try to solve are uh, election forecasting, resource allocation, predictive modeling, content testing, and attribution, uh, uh, which is a lot uh, and, and keeps us very busy. In doing that, uh, we conduct thousand, we, like in 2020, uh, I think the exact number is we conducted 6,000 RCTs on over 6 million people. Uh, we helped allocate hundreds of millions of dollars uh, worth of uh, media spend. Uh, and we produced a forecast for every single House, Senate, Governor, presidential ballot measure, and state legislative race in the country. And in doing that, had to score billions of rows per day uh, and train on millions of rows per day. Uh, the actual team, as of right now, is about seven machine learning engineers, three data scientists. Uh, it's unclear what the division between those two are, but those are the titles. Uh, two Bayesian statisticians, seven software engineers, and four political operatives. Uh, so just to, what is it that analytics and data science and politics actually does? Uh, I'd say there's kind of we have a, a boring, unromantic way to look at it is there's kind of three core questions. Uh, what races are close and where should I spend my money? Uh, what messaging should I base my campaign about on? What should I talk about? What creative works? What creative doesn't work? And then once you decide what races you're going to focus on and what you're going to talk about, how do you actually reach voters um, and how do you target? Uh, and all of those things, you know, coming out of 2016, you know, we're broken um, in some way. Uh, traditional survey research doesn't work super well anymore, uh, as I think any observers uh, of polling can tell. Uh, you know, uh, the way that campaigns historically figured out what worked and what didn't was by asking small groups, and I mean like six or seven people, uh, to self-report how, how much they liked different things, which has problems. Um, and, you know, traditionally, and, and uh, you know, the way that campaigns talk to people, you know, hasn't changed in 30 years. Um, so just to talk through each of uh, each of these, uh, one by one, or at least two of these, um, this is a graph uh, going back to 2016, you know, kind of all of our happy places, I suppose. Um, uh, it has a lot going on. Every single bar is net spending by electoral vote segmented out by, uh, by state in the battleground states. And you know what you can see is that uh, even though Hillary Clinton had about three times more money overall than Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump outspent Hillary Clinton in the tipping point state that actually decided the election substantially, which is quite bad. Uh, in, and the reason you know why this happened was basically that all of the polls uh, showed that uh, Wisconsin uh, wasn't going to be close. This is you know in general public polling has uh, stopped working. Uh, over the past six years or so. And uh, the root cause of this uh, is that uh, survey response rates are a lot lower than they used to be. 
Uh, polling wor working is fundamentally uh, dependent on an exchangeability assumption that the people who answer your surveys are the same as the people who don't. Uh, once you uh, control for the things that you control for. And survey takers have now become so strange that the traditional set of things that people control for are no longer enough. Uh, the answer to this uh, is either to get people to take more surveys, which is very hard, or to control for more things. And unfortunately, uh, traditional, uh, uh, traditional waiting techniques fail when you need to control for 20 things instead of four things, uh, which you know, leads you to using bias estimators and all of this other stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think this slide originally uh, was immediately before the 20, uh, 2020 election, uh, but basically uh, what you can, a lot of people coming out of 2018 thought that polling was fixed, but what you can see is that here, this is showing uh, polling bias by state in 2018 and in 2016, and you see a pretty consistent error pattern. In 2020 also, uh, if you made a similar graph would look identical, just shifted down. Um, so talking about messaging, I'd say the highest impact thing we've done is that we've built out the infrastructure to do RCTs um, uh, of TV advertisements. In 2020, we tested every single Democratic and Republican ad that went on the air. Uh, you know, what we found was that roughly 20% of ads uh, that Democrats made made people more likely to vote for Republicans. And uh, generally speaking, the more people in the office liked the ads, the worse that they did. So underrated theory of change is find those ads and not show them to people. So big picture, just to describe what we actually do, um, I'd say that we have, uh, we do a lot of surveys. We survey millions of people. I think we surveyed about 6 million people in 2020 and something like 3 million in 2021 so far. Uh, then we have a voter file of uh, every single person in the country and a variety of first party data from, uh, from uh, campaigns. Uh, the Democratic Party has, over the course of the last 30 years, contacted roughly 186 million people at least once, obviously some people much more than once, and some of those people quite far away. The database administration archaeology is fun. There are The Minnesota Democratic Party has roughly half a million Michael Dukakis IDs from 1988 that somehow were stored, though obviously Minnesota Democratic Party is unsurprisingly better at data management than uh, other states. Um, and big picture what we do is that we fit models on our survey data and then we and then we score basically every person in the country and that's kind of you know the big big picture of what we actually do is fit those models so why is this hard um the first is that politics uh has a lot of structure um you know there's a in, voting behavior is uh you know driven by a bunch of highly correlated yet distinct factors like ethnicity, socioeconomic class, religion, et cetera, many of which are themselves latent um, and that we don't get to observe directly. The relative importance of all of these correlated factors can vary a lot across space and time. And uh, because we have to do all of this pool pooling and because surveys are expensive, um, you know, we, it, we have to do a lot of regularization across time and space and context. The other issue is that our data is very biased. Um, our, you know, mathematically, our training sets are very different than our scoring sets. Uh, people who take surveys are incredibly weird. Um, and we have to adjust for things like uh, atti attitudes toward the Bible or social, uh, social trust or attitudes toward corporal punishment in order to make survey takers even kind of resemble the overall public. And then, you know, the other point is that even though uh, you know we're fitting models in order to do all of our inference, uh, our actual objective functions uh, are not related to AUC. Um, you know there are uh, lots of things that do not affect the overall performance of the model. You know one example is that in you know southern West Virginia there are an enormous number of people. I think in West Virginia's third congressional district, something like 55% of people are registered Democrats, even though. Uh, I think uh, Joe Biden got about 18% of the vote there. And uh, it's very easy for a variety of models to get that wrong. And getting it wrong, because not that many people live there, uh, ends up not impacting your AOC. But if you end up allocating millions of dollars into a place um, that isn't actually close, then uh, that's actually quite bad. And the other point is that we are trying to estimate a lot of effects that are quite small, um, but unfortunately, sometimes uh, can, can become quite large. And then there's another point, um, you know, just to 
talk about this bullet, is that uh, Barack Obama got 52% of the vote, of the two-party vote in 2012, and Hillary Clinton got 51.1%. And uh, that 0.9% drop is not very large, um, but clearly ended up mattering uh, a great deal uh, to the world and to all of us. Um, just to talk about uh, some of these non-response issues uh, and, and how they can end up impacting accuracy. Uh, here, we're looking at social trust using the GSS's social tr trust question. Uh, you know, they basically ask people, do you think that people can be trusted or do you think that people uh, cannot be trusted? And, uh, you know, what you can see is that among folks uh, who trust the people around them, that group swung toward Democrats from 2012 to 2016. Well, uh, regardless of education group, but if you look at folks who do not trust the people around them, then uh, that group as a whole swung heavily against us. And unsurprisingly, people who trust the people around them and institutions are much, much more likely to answer phone surveys, uh, which is you know one of the big reasons uh, you know why we saw uh, the public, why we've seen the repeated public polling errors that we've seen. Um, and this kind of shows how. There are a lot of things like this um, that you have to account for uh, in order to actually make public opinion estimates reasonably accurate. Another big issue uh, is that, uh, you know, there are a lot of deviations um, from linearity across context. So this is a fun table that shows uh, basically two-way support uh, for Clinton, as well as uh, three-way ideology uh, by race and religiosity and education. And what you can see is that there are a lot of deep interactions here where, uh, you know, just to call out some of them, uh, Clinton percent uh, is highly non-sensitive uh, among African-Americans to all of these things. But, uh, but when you look at identifying as a liberal, actually uh, African-Americans and white folks are relatively exchangeable with respect to religiosity and education when predicting whether or not you identify as liberal, even if that's not true um, for, uh, for Clinton percent. Other fun examples are that if you uh, if you are uh, if you are white, then generally speaking, uh, going from the highest level of religiosity to the lowest one, uh, generally speaking, makes you more supportive uh, of Democrats by very large amounts. But among African Americans, the opposite is true. Generally speaking, uh, highly religious African Americans are more democratic, even if they are more conservative. Uh, than, uh, than secular ones. And, you know, that has a lot to do with the historical context of black churches and other things. Other fun examples of this are that having a college degree, generally speaking, among white people makes you more liberal. But if you are a, uh, uh, if you are highly religious, then having a college degree makes you kind of understand that you're supposed to be a Republican and actually has the opposite sign. And just to say, all of these numbers are based on surveys of roughly two or three million people. So all of these differences that you see are statistically significant, um, uh, which is fun. Um, another fun example of this is that uh, there is still a lot of regional variation in politics across both space and context. So here I'm showing in Florida and West Virginia, two-way Democratic vote share uh, for the presidential race in 2016, and then the Senate race in 2018. And what you can see here is that in Florida, uh, party registration closely tracks both presidential vote and Senate vote. But in West Virginia, where a very large fraction of people are still registered Democrats, even though it's now a highly Republican state, uh, Hillary Clinton lost uh, registered Democrats um, because a lot of those registered Democrats have since changed party. But Joe Manchin, uh, who was the governor, because they still remember who he is and like him, uh, those registered Democrats still vote for him, um, even though uh, you know, even though they, uh, even though they're still, even though they're Republicans federally. And there are a lot of these kind of things, and we have to detect them across, you know, the literally thousands of races that exist in U.S. politics. Um, you know, another big thing uh, is, you know, this is this is a graph from 2012. Uh, where we compare basically uh, the actual, you know, the Gallup, weekly Gallup polling for the presidential race versus, uh, you know, our internal tracker, which was based on modeling and a bunch of other things. And, you know, what you could see is that the vast majority, um, if you actually do a decomposition of variance, uh, about 95% of the variance in public polls is either sampling error or pollster bias. Um, and only 5% of that uh, ends up being public opinion. 
And that's something that is, uh, is, is very hard and annoying because measuring small effects in a highly noisy context is uh, annoying and difficult and hard. Um, but even though, like if you go over here, throughout the entire campaign, uh, the, every, the public opinion stayed within a one point range, sometimes things can change very quickly. So this is showing support for Joe Biden in the Democratic primary uh, between Nevada and Super Tuesday. And you know what you can see is that after the South Carolina primary, uh, Joe Biden uh, improve, uh, in had saw his support increase by something like 30% over the course of literally three days. Um, you know, we were doing, uh, we were serving at this point, uh, I think thousands of people um, every day, and we could see that his support was increasing by about a third of a percent per hour. Um, and so that's a real problem. If you're fitting Bayesian models, highly parametric Bayesian models, sometimes stuff like this happens and you need your systems to be robust to that, even if they very rarely happen. And then, you know, uh, it turns out doing all of this different work really does lead to materially better forecasts. Um, you know, here we show uh, comparing to 538, you know, we've had roughly half the mean squared error of 538 in our last two election cycles. Generally speaking, our September forecasts are more accurate than, uh, than public polling's uh, election day forecasts. And you can see that, you know, in the Democratic primary, we also did quite well compared to our competitors here. Um, so just to talk through, some challenges doing data science in politics. You know, the first um, is that, and I think this is probably common, is that business questions from clients, you know, things like, what do we do about Georgia, um, usually lack a straightforward mapping to a well-defined statistical question. But if you focus on problems that are well-defined, uh, then that heavily limits your relevance and your impact. And so, uh, even when well-defined, uh, there are a lot of important questions that are impossible to answer with certainty. Um, you know, it, there are it, one big, just for example, one big problem that is important to what we do is allocating TV ad spend. And, you know, we do our, the best that we can econometrically to estimate things like, you know, the decay of ad spend or the overall treatment effects or all of these other things. Um, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that are impossible to know, and we have to be willing to uh, step back on parametric models of the world um, and do the best that we can in order to avoid decision paralysis. Because at the end of the day, there's $500 million, it has to be spent, and arguing about instruments um, you know, ultimately uh, doesn't do anything. And then the other point, um, and this is something that I've evolved a lot on, is I remember in you know 2012, when I was uh, 20 years old, I, uh, I really resented, I think, a lot of the pointy-headed bosses, I guess, or the old school consultants who you know, didn't have a background in social science or statistics or math. Um, but looking back, you know, I think that 80% of my disagreements with them, um, uh, with 10 years of experience and more data and everything, I, I, I think that 80% of the time they were right. And, uh, and or they were right and I was wrong. Uh, and so I think a big lesson there is that you know, in the real world, in real organizations, it is very hard to rise to the top. And even if folks don't know about math or social science or statistics, they actually they actually do have uh, quite a bit of important wisdom and ignoring them uh, is a bad idea. All right. So just to talk about Stan and R, uh, you know, all of our production models are Bayesian, which is very exciting. All of our time series tools are fully in Stan. Uh, you know, we, in terms of the actual nuts and bolts of what we do, uh, generally we do everything uh, with variational inference and TensorFlow probability. Uh, you know, this, uh, this generally speaking uh, means, I mean, we have to do this just because, you know, you have millions of rows and hundreds of columns. Uh, but as I think if anyone here has ever worked with variational inference, it does not work very well. Um, and uh, we've really had to do a lot of Oracle testing and validation in order to trust the results. And even then, it, it really does break a lot, um, unfortunately. Doing large scale hierarchical Bayesian modeling is very difficult. Um, all right. Well, that's the talk. Thanks again for uh, letting me uh, present here. And uh, I'll hang out in the chat if anyone ever wants to ask any questions or reach out. Thank you.